Welcome everyone to theCUBE's presentation of the AWS Startup Showcase, AI Machine Learning Top Stars, Building Generative AI on AWS. This is season three, episode one of the ongoing series covering the exciting startups from the AWS ecosystem to talk about AI and machine learning. I'm your host, John Furrier. We're joined by two great guests here, Adam Winchell, who's the CEO of Arthur and Chief Scientist of Arthur, John Dickerson, talk about how they help people build better LLM AI systems to get them into the market faster. Gentlemen, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having us, John. Well, I got to say, I got to temper my enthusiasm because the last few months, explosion of interest in LLMs with ChatGPT has kind of opened the eyes to everybody around the reality of that this is going next gen. This is it. This is the moment. You know, this is, this is the, the point we're going to look back and say, this is the time where AI really kind of hit the scene for real, real applications. So a lot of large language models, also known as LLMs, foundational models, and generative AI is all booming. This is where all the alpha developers are going. This is where everyone's focusing their business model transformations on. This is where developers are seeing action. So it's all happening. The wave is here. So I got to ask you guys, what are you guys seeing right now? You're in the middle of it. It's hitting, the, hitting you guys right on. You're in the front end of this massive wave. Yeah, John, I don't think you have to uh, temper your enthusiasm at all. I mean, what we're seeing every single day is you know, everything from existing enterprise customers coming in with new ways that they're rethinking like business things that they've been doing for many years that they can now do in an entirely different way, as well as like all manner of new companies popping up, applying, you know, LLMs to everything from generating code and SQL statements to generating, uh, you know, um, health transcripts and, and uh, just legal briefs, everything you can imagine, right? And uh, and when you actually sit down and like look at these systems and, and the, the demos we get of them, like the, the, the hype is definitely uh, justified. It's pretty amazing what they're going to do. Um, and even just internally, you know, we built about a month ago in January, we built a an Arthur chatbot for so customers could ask questions, technical questions from our, rather than read our product um, documentation, they could just ask this LLM for uh, a particular question and get an answer. And um, you know, we at the time it was like state of the art, but then just last week we decided to rebuild it because the tooling has changed so much um, that we last week we completely rebuilt it. It's now like way better, built on an entirely different stack, uh, and it's you know the, the tooling has undergone a full generation worth of change in like six weeks, which is crazy. So it just tells you how much energy is going into this and how fast it's evolving right now. John, weigh in as a chief scientist. This is like, I mean, you must be like blown away. It's like, you know, talk about the kid in the candy store. I mean, you must be looking like the same. I mean, she must be super busy to begin with, but the change, the acceleration, can you scope the kind of change you're seeing and be specific around the areas of seeing movement and, and highly accelerated change? Yeah, definitely, uh, and it is very, very exciting. Actually, uh, thinking back to uh, when ChatGPT was announced, that was a night we were actually, uh, our company was throwing an event at NeurIPS, which is like a maybe the biggest machine learning conference out there. And, uh, you know, the hype when that happened was palatable, and it, it was just shocking to see how, how well that performed. And then obviously over the last few months, uh, since then, uh, as LLMs have continued to sort of uh, uh, enter the market, um, we've seen use cases for them, like Adam mentioned, all over the place. And so some things I'm excited about in this space are the use of LLMs and uh, more generally foundation models to redesign like traditional operations research style problems, logistics problems, like auctions, uh, decisioning problems. So moving beyond uh, the already amazing use cases like you know creating marketing content into sort of more core integration and a lot of the the sort of bread and butter uh, companies and tasks uh, that you know drive the American ecosystem. And uh, I, I think we're just starting to see some of that. And uh, in the next 12 months, I think we're going to see a lot more. If I had to make other predictions, uh, I think we're going to continue seeing a lot of work being done on uh, managing like inference time costs via shrinking models or distillation. Uh, and uh, I don't know how to make this prediction, but you know, at some point we're going to be seeing lots of these very, very like large scale models uh, operating on the edge as well. So, you know, the time scales are extremely compressed, like Adam mentioned, uh, 12 months from now, hard to say. We, we, were, we were talking on theCUBE prior to this session here, we had the CUBE conversation here, and then the Wall Street Journal just kind of picked up on the same theme, which is the printing press moment created the enlightenment stage of, of, the, of history. Here we're in the whole nother automating intellect, efficiency, um, doing heavy lifting, kind of the creative class coming back. A whole nother level of, of reality around the corner that's being hyped up. The question is, is this justified? Is there really a breakthrough here? Or is this just another result of continued progress with AI? Can you guys 
weigh in because there's two schools of thought. There's the, oh my God, we're entering a new enlightenment tech phase of like the equivalent of the printing press um, in, all, in all areas. Others, ah, it's just AI, it's you know, inch by inch. What's your guy's opinion? Yeah, I think you know. On, on the one hand, when you're when you're down in the weeds of building AI systems all day, every day, like we are, it's it's easy to sort of look at this as an incremental progress. Like we have customers who've been building on foundation models since we started the company four years ago, um, particularly in computer vision for classification tasks, starting with pre-trained models, things like that. So uh, that part of it doesn't feel real new. But what does feel new is just um, you know when you apply these things to language um, with all the breakthroughs and sort of um, computational efficiency, algorithmic improvements, things like that. Uh, you know, when you actually sit down and interact with ChatGPT or one of the other systems that's out there that's building on top of LLMs, um, it, it, it really is breathtaking, like the level of understanding that they have uh, and how quickly you can accelerate, you know, your development efforts and get like an actual working um, uh, system in place that solves like a really important real world problem and makes people way faster, way more efficient. Um, so I do think there's, there's definitely something there. It's more than just incremental improvement. This feels like a, a real kind of um, trajectory inflection point for uh, for the adoption of AI. John, what's your take on this? As people come into the field, I'm seeing a lot of people move from, hey, I've been coding in Python, I've been doing some development, I've been a software engineer, I'm a computer science student, I'm, I'm coding in C++, old school, OG systems person. Where do they come in? Where's the focus? Where's the action? Where are the breakthroughs? Where, do, where, where are people jumping in um, and getting their, rolling up their sleeves and, 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 and getting dirty with this stuff. Yeah, uh, all over the place. And uh, it's funny you mentioned students uh, in a different life. I, uh, I wore a, a university professor hat. And so very, very familiar with sort of the, the teaching aspects of this. And I will say uh, toward Adam's point, this really is a leap forward and that, you know, techniques like uh, like GitHub Copilot, for example, have just, you know, everybody's using them right now. And they, they really do uh, accelerate the way that, that we develop. Uh, when I think about the areas where, you know, people are really, really focusing right now, uh, tooling is certainly one of them, right? Like you and I were, were you know, chatting about LangChain right before, before this interview started. Uh, you know, two or three people can sit down and create like an amazing uh, set of pipes that connect different aspects of the LLM ecosystem. Uh, two, I would say, is in engineering. So like distributed training might be one, uh, or just, you know, understanding better ways to uh, even be able to train large models, understanding better ways uh, to then distill them or run them. So like there's this 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 heavy interaction now between engineering and what I might call like traditional machine learning uh, from 10 years ago where you know you had to know a lot of math, you had to know you know calculus very well, things like that. Yeah. Now you also need to be again a very strong engineer, which is exciting. You know, I interviewed Swami when he talked about the news he's ahead of Amazon's uh, machine learning and AI when they announced hugging face announcement. I reminded him like when how Amazon was like easy to get into if you were developing a startup back in 2007, eight, and that the language models had that similar problem. It's step up a lot of content and a lot of um, expense to get provisioned up. Now it's easy. So this is kind of the, the next wave of innovation. So how do you guys see that from, from where we are right now? Are we at that point where it's that moment where it's that cloud-like experience for LLMs and large language models? Yeah, go ahead, John. You want to... uh, I think the answer is yes, right? We see a, a number of large a large companies that are training these and serving these, uh, some of which uh, are being co-interviewed in this um, in this uh, episode. Um, I, I think we're at that, right? Like, you can hit one of these with a with a simple, you know, single line of Python hitting an API. Like, you know, you can boot this up in in, in seconds if you want. Uh, it's it's easy. Got it. Uh, so I think. Well, let's take a step back and talk about the company. You guys are being featured here on, on the showcase, Arthur. What drove you to start the company? How'd this all come together? Uh, what's the origination story? Obviously, you got, you got big customers. How to get started? What are you guys doing? How do you make money? Give a quick overview. Yeah, I think John and I come at it from slightly different uh, angles, but you know, for myself, um, I've been a part of a number of tech technology companies. Um, my, I joined Capital One, they acquired my last company, and uh, shortly after I joined, they asked me to start their AI team. And so even though I've been doing AI for a long time, I started my career back in, in, in DARPA. Um, it was the first time I, I was really working at scale in AI at, a, at an organization where, you know, there were hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue at stake with the operation of these models and that they were impacting, you know, millions of people's financial livelihoods. And so it just got me hyper-focused on these issues around uh, making sure that the, your AI worked well and it worked well for your, your company and it worked well for the, the people who were um, being affected by it. So 
Um, that's, you know, at the time when I was doing this, 20, 2016, 2017, 2018, there just wasn't any tooling out there to kind of support this production management model monitoring life phase of the life cycle. Uh, and so we basically left to start the the company that that I wanted. And, you know, John John has a, a, his own story, which I'll let, let, let you share that one, John. Go ahead, John, you're up. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I'm coming at this from a, from, a, from a different world. So I'm on leave now from a tenured role in academia where I was leading a large lab focusing on sort of the intersection of machine learning and economics. And so questions like, uh, fairness or you know the response to the dynamism on the underlying environment uh, have been around for quite a long time in that space. And so I've been thinking very deeply about some of those more like R&D style questions, uh, as well as having uh, deployed some uh, automation code uh, across a couple of different industries, uh, some in online advertising, uh, some in the healthcare space and so on, where concerns of, again, fairness uh, come to bear. And so uh, Adam and I connected um, uh, uh, to sort of understand uh, the space of what that might look like uh, in the 2018-2019 realm uh, from a quantitative and from a human-centered human -centered point of view. And so uh, sort of booted things up from there. Yeah, bring that applied engineering R&D into the Capital One DNA that he had at scale. I could see that fit. I, I got to ask you now, next step, as you guys move out and think about LLMs and, and the recent AI news around the generative models and the foundational models like ChatGPT, how, are you, how should, we be looking at that news and everyone watching might be thinking the same thing. I know at the board level companies are like, we should refactor our business. This is the future. It's that kind of moment. And the tech team's like, okay, boss, how do we do, <laughs> why do, we do this again? Or, or are they prepared? How should we be thinking? How should people watching be thinking about LLMs? Yeah, I think they are. They're they really are transformative, and so I mean we're seeing companies all over the place. Everything from large tech companies to you know a lot of our large enterprise customers are launching significant projects at core parts of their business. And so yeah, I, I would be surprised like if you're if you're serious about becoming an AI native company, which most leading companies are, uh, then you know this is a trend that you need to be taking seriously. And we're seeing the adoption rate. You know, it's funny. I would say like. You know the, adopt, the the AI adoption kind of in the the broader business world really started you know let's call it four or five years ago, um, and it was a relatively slow adoption rate. But I think all that kind of investment and in, in scaling the maturity curve has paid off because the rate at which people are adopting and deploying systems based on this is like tremendous. I mean, this has all just happened in a few months, and we're already seeing people get systems into production. So um, now there are a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of things you have to guarantee in order to put these in production in a way that um, basically. Uh, is added to your business and doesn't cause more headaches than it than it, uh, than it solves. And so that's where we help customers is where, you know, how do you how do you put these out there in a way that they're they're going to represent your company well, they're going to perform well, they're going to they're they're going to do their job and, uh, and and do it properly. So in the use case as a customer, as I think about this, there's workflows, they might have had an ML AI AI ops team that's around IT, um, their inference engines are out there. Mm -hmm. They probably don't have a visibility on say how much it costs, they're kicking the tires. When you look at the deployment, there's a cost piece, there's a workflow piece, um, there's fairness you mentioned, um, John. What what should be I should be thinking about if I'm a, if I'm going to be deploying stuff into production? I got I got to think about those things. Uh, what's your opinion? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to dive in on that one. So. Uh, monitoring in general uh, is extremely important once you have uh, one of these LLMs in production. And there have been some changes versus sort of traditional monitoring uh, that we, we can dive deeper into uh, that LLMs have really accelerated. Uh, but a lot of that sort of like bread and butter style of things you should be looking out for uh, remain uh, just as important as, as, as they are for sort of what, what, what you might call traditional machine learning models, right? So like the underlying environment data streams, the way users interact with these models, these are all changing over time. And so any performance metrics that you care about, you know, traditional ones like an accuracy, if you can define that for an LLM, ones around, for example, fairness or bias, if, you, if that is a concern for your particular use case uh, and so on, those need to be tracked. Now there are some interesting changes that LLMs are bringing along as well, right? So most, most ML, uh, models in production uh, that, that we see are relatively static in the sense that like, you know, they're not getting flipped in uh, more than maybe once a day or once a week, or they're just, you know, set once and then not changed ever again. With LLMs, uh, there's this ongoing sort of value alignment or collection of preferences from users that is uh, often, you know, constantly updating the model. Uh, and so that opens up all sorts of new uh, sort of vectors for, I won't say attack, but for problems to arise in production, right? Like users might learn to use your system in a different way. 
and thus change the way those preferences are getting collected and thus change your system in ways that sort of you did never, never, never intended, right? So maybe that went through uh, governance already internally at the company and now it's totally, totally changed. And it's, it's through no fault of your own, but you need to be watching over that for sure. Talk about the reinforced learnings from human feedback. How's that factoring in to the LLMs? Is that part of it? Should people be thinking about that? Is that a component that's important? Uh, it certainly is. Yeah. So this is this is uh, you know one of the big tweaks that happened with Instruct GPT, which is um, uh, sort of the the basis model um, behind uh, behind Chat GPT, uh, and has since you know gone on to be used all over the place. So. Uh, value alignment, I think, is is through RLHF, like you mentioned, uh, is is a very interesting space to get into, and it's one that you need to watch over, right? Like, you're asking humans uh, for feedback over outputs from a model, and then you're updating the model with respect to that human feedback, and now you've thrown humans into the loop here in a way that uh, is just going to complicate things, right? And it certainly helps in many ways, right? You can ask humans to, let's say that you're deploying an internal chatbot. Uh, at an enterprise, you could ask humans to uh, align uh, that LLM behind the chatbot uh, to say company values, right? And so you're eliciting feedback about these company values, and that's going to kind of scoot that chatbot that you're running internally more toward you know the kind of language that you'd like to use internally on like a Slack channel or something like that. Um, watching over that that model, I think uh, in that specific case, right? That's that's a compliance and HR issue as well, right? So uh, while it is part of the greater sort of LLM sort of stack, you can also view that as an independent bit to watch over. Got it, and these are important factors. When people see the Bing news, they go, they freak out, have, it's doing great, then it goes off the rails and it goes big, fails big, right? So these models, you know, people see that. Is that human interaction or is that feedback? Is that is that not accepting it? Or how, how do people understand how to take that input in and, and how to build the right apps for around LLMs? This is a tough question. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, so some of the you know examples that you'll see online uh, where these chatbots go off the rails um, are obviously humans trying to break the system, but some of them some of them clearly aren't, right? And that's because uh, you know these these are large statistical models, and uh, uh, we don't know what's going to pop out of them all the time. And even if you're you know doing as much in-house testing at you know the, the the big companies like the Coheres and the OpenAI's of the world to try to prevent things like you know toxicity or or racism um, or you know other sorts of quote unquote bad content that uh, that might lead to bad PR, uh, you're never going to catch all of these uh, sort of possible holes uh, in the model itself. And so it's again, it's very very important to to keep watching over that while it's in production. On the business model side, how are you guys doing? What's the approach? How do you guys engage with customers? Take a minute to explain the customer engagement. What do they need? What do you need? How's that work? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So it's you know, really easy to get started. We can have, you know, it's literally a matter of like just handing out an API key and people can can get started. Um, and so, you know, we also offer uh, alternative, we also offer versions that are can be installed on-prem for air, uh, models that, you know, we find a lot of our customers have models that deal with very sensitive data. So you can run it in your your cloud account or or uh, use our cloud version. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to get started with this stuff. Uh, we find people start using it a lot of times during the um, validation phase, because that way they can start kind of baselining performance of models, they can do champion challenger, they can, you know, really kind of baseline the performance of maybe they're considering different foundation models. And so it's a really helpful tool for understanding like differences in the way these models perform. Um, and then from there they can go into, you know, they can they can just kind of flow that into their production inferencing so that as these systems are out there, you have really kind of real time, uh, you know, monitoring for anomalies and for all sorts of weird behaviors, uh, as well as, um, uh, that continuous feedback loop that that helps you make you know make your product get better and, and observability and you can run all sorts of aggregated um, reports to really kind of understand what's going on with these models when they're out there deciding. Um, I should also add that we uh, just today um, have have a, another way to kind of uh, adopt Arthur and that is we are in the um, the AWS marketplace and so we are available there just to make it you know that much easier to use your cloud credits, skip the kind of procurement process and and um, uh, and, and get up and running really quickly. And that's great because Amazon's got like SageMaker, which handles a lot of privacy stuff, all kinds of cool things, um, or you can get down and dirty. So I got to ask on the next one, production is a big deal, getting stuff into production. What have you guys learned uh, can, that you could share to folks watching? Is there a cost issue? I got to monitor, obviously you brought that up. Uh, you talked about the human reinforcement issues, all these things are happening. What is the big learnings that you could share for people that are going to put these into production? 
uh, to watch out for, to plan for, to be prepared for, hope for the best, plan for the worst. What's your advice? I can give a couple of opinions there, and I'm sure Adam has opinions <laughs> as well. Uh, yeah, the, the big one from 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 my side is again, I, I, I mentioned this earlier. It's just the input data streams, because because humans are are also exploring how they can use these systems to begin with. It's it's really really hard to predict sort of the the type of inputs you're going to be seeing in in production, right? Especially we always talk about chatbots, but any any sort of generative sort of text tasks like this, right? Let's say you're taking in. Uh, uh, news articles and summarizing them or something like that, right? Like it's it's very hard to get a good sampling even of the sort of set of uh, of news articles in such a way that you can really predict uh, what's going to pop out of that model. So to me, it's it's adversarial maybe isn't the word that I would use, but it's 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 uh, like an unnatural shifting input distribution of uh, like prompts that you might see for these models. Um, that's certainly one. And then the second one that I would talk about is. Um, you know, it can be hard to understand uh, the costs, the inference time costs behind these LLMs. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the pricing on these is, is always changing as, as the models change size, you know, it might go up, might go down based on model size, based on energy cost and so on. Uh, but your pricing, you know, per token or per a thousand tokens, and that, that I think can be difficult uh, for some clients to wrap their head around. Again, um, uh, you don't know how these systems are going to be used a priori, so it can be tough. And so again, that's another metric that, that really should be tracked. Yeah, and there's a lot of trade-off choices in there with like, you know, how many tokens do you want at each at each step and in the sequence and and uh, you know, based on you, you oftentimes you reject these tokens and so based on how your system's operating that can make the cost highly variable. And that's if you're using like an API version that you're kind of paying per token. A lot of people also choose to run these um, in, internally and, and as John mentioned, the inference time on these is significantly higher than like a traditional Class, even an NLP classification model or tabular data model, like orders of magnitude higher. And so you really need to kind of understand how that is, you know, as you're, as you're kind of constantly iterating on these models and putting out new versions and new features in these models, uh, how that's affecting like the overall um, scale of the, of that inference cost, because, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can use a lot of computing power uh, very quickly with these models. Yeah, scale, performance, price, all come together. Uh, I got to ask while we're here on the secret sauce of the company, if you had to describe the people out there watching, what's the secret sauce of the company? What's the key to your success? Yeah, so John John leads our research team, and you know they've had a number of really cool. Uh, um, you know, I, I think AI, as much as it's been hyped for a while, it's still commercial AI at least is is, is really in its infancy. And so, you know, the, the way we're able to um, pioneer new ways to think about performance for computer vision, NLP, uh, LLMs is probably the thing that I'm I'm proudest about. Um, John and his team publish papers all the time at at, at NERVS and other places, but I think it's really kind of being able to define what performance means for like basically any kind of model type and, and give people really powerful tools to, to understand that on an ongoing basis. John, secret sauce, what's your, what's your, how would you describe it? You got all the action happening all around you. Yeah, well, I mean, I appreciate Adam talking me up like that. No, I <laughs> <laughs> Props to you. <laughs> I, I would also say a couple of other things here. So we have a, a very strong engineering team. And so I think some early hires there really set the standard uh, at, a, at a very high uh, high bar that, that we've maintained uh, as we've grown. And I think that's really paid dividends as scalability has um, uh, become even more of a, a challenge in these spaces, right? And so that's not just scalability when it comes to LLMs, that's scalability when it comes to, you know, like uh, millions of inferences per day, that kind of thing as well in traditional ML models. And I think that's compared to potential competitors, uh, that's really sort of, um, uh, well, it's made us able to just operate more efficiently, right? And, and pass pass that along to the to the client. Yeah, and I think the infancy comment is really important because it's the beginning. You really there's a long journey ahead, a lot of change coming. Like I guess it's a huge wave. So I'm sure you guys got a lot of lot of plannings at the foundation for even for your own company. So I appreciate the uh, the candid response there. Final question for you guys is: How do people? What should the top things be for a company in 2023? If I'm going to set the agenda and I'm a customer, I'm moving forward, putting the pedal to the metal, so to speak, what are the top things I should be prioritizing or I need to do to be successful with AI in 2023? Yeah, I think so. Number one, as we talked about, we've been talking about this entire episode, the things are changing so quickly and the opportunities for business transformation and you know, really kind of disrupting different, uh, different applications, different use cases is like, Almost, um, you know, I don't think we've even fully comprehended how big it is, and so really digging into your to your business and understanding like where I can apply these new sets of foundation models is, you know, that's a top priority. The interesting thing is, I think we're also there. There's sort of um, 
there's another force at play, which is sort of the, the macroeconomic conditions. And a lot of places are, um, you know, they're having to work harder to justify budgets. So in the past, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe they sort of had a blank check to spend on AI and AI development at a lot of, a lot of large enterprises that was, you know, limited primarily by the amount of talent they could scoop up. Um, nowadays, like new, new, like, uh, you know, these expenditures are getting scrutinized more. And so one of the things that we, um, we really help our customers with is like, really calculating the ROI on these things. And so, you know, if, you're, if your model's out there performing and you have a new version that you can put out that lifts the performance by 3%, how many, you know, tens of millions of dollars does that mean in business benefit? Or if, I'm, if I want to get, you know, go to, go to uh, you know, get approval from the CFO to spend, you know, a few million dollars on this new project, how, do, how can I bake in from the beginning the tools to really show the ROI uh, along the way? Because, you know, I think in these systems when done well, for a software project, the ROI can be like pretty spectacular. Like we see, you know, over 100% our, our, um, ROI in the first year on some of these projects. And so I think in 2023, you just need to be able to like show what you're getting for that spend. It's a needle moving moment. You see it all the time with some of these, um, these aha moments are like, whoa, blown away. John, I want to get your thoughts on this because one of the things that comes up a lot for companies that I talk to that are kind of on the second wave, I would say coming in, maybe not, maybe the front wave of adopters is talent and team. Team building, you mentioned some of the hires you got were game changing for you guys and set the bar high. As you move the needle, new developers will need to come in. What's your advice given that you've been a professor, you, you've seen students. I know a lot of computer science people want to shift. They might not be yet skilled in AI, but they are proficient in programming. Is that going to be another opportunity with open source and things are happening? How do you talk to that next level of talent that wants to come in to this market to supplement teams and be on teams, lead teams. Any advice you have for people who want to build their teams and people who are out there and want to be a coder in AI? Yeah, yeah, I have advice, uh, and this actually works for uh, what, it, what it would take to be a successful AI company in 2023 as well, which is just don't be afraid to iterate really quickly with these tools, right? The space is still being explored on what they can be used for. Uh, a lot of the tasks that they're used for now, they're not new tasks, right? Like creating marketing content using a, a, a machine learning is not a new thing to do. It just works really well now. And so I'm excited to see what the next year brings in terms of uh, folks from outside of core computer science who are, you know, other engineers or physicists or chemists or whatever, uh, who are learning how to use these increasingly easy to use tools to leverage LLMs for tasks that I think none of us have really thought about before. So that's really, really exciting. And so toward that, I would say iterate quickly, right? Like build things uh, on your own, build demos, show them to friends, you know, host them uh, online uh, and uh, you'll learn along the way uh, and you'll have something to show for it. And also we're, you know, you'll help us explore that space. Guys, congratulations with Arthur, great company, great picks and shovels opportunities out there for everybody. Iterate fast, get in quickly, and don't be afraid to iterate. Great, great advice. And thank you for coming on and being part of the uh, AWS Showcase, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us on, John, always a pleasure. Yeah, great stuff. Adam Winchell and John Dickerson uh, with Arthur. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. And this is, I'm John Furrier, your host. Generative AI on AWS, keep it right there for more action with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.